welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray. The reason I'm getting down on my knees is because two reasons. One and very important, I need to humble my heart before the Lord. I need God to speak to you today. It isn't me, it isn't my words, it's the words of God that you will hear. The second thing is I need to practice getting up. (laughs) And that in itself is a miracle all by itself. (laughs) So come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. Thank you, chaplain. (laughs) Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Here's our hearts today, Lord. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a young man. We haven't come to hear from an old man. We haven't come to hear from a white man. We haven't come to hear from a black man. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be, all that the Son paid the price for us to be, and all that you would desire us to be. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory as you bless us this day. We thank you, Father, that we can truly say that we want you to bless us, but not only us, every church in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that's preaching and teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to bless them also. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, The Way. We thank you, God, and bless you, Lord, for all the churches that are out there, uh, like uh, our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. But we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you, sir. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. Well, go with me, if you will, into Hebrews in the fourth chapter. I I told you a number of months ago that Hebrews, the fourth chapter, is power-packed. We're still not finished with it. I thought for sure they'd get through this chapter, but they didn't. It's just so full of good stuff, and today is, without a doubt, fascinating. I'm going to take you to one verse. Before I give you the title of that one verse, I need to chat with you about what's going on. It's an amazing verse that if you listen today, it's life-changing. Like I said the last service, this is hot off the press of the Holy Spirit's heart. Could I say this to you? I've probably taught this verse 25 times in my life, but I've never in my life even come close to teaching what is going to be taught today. It's absolutely new to me too. I never saw it in the light that it is. It is absolutely fascinating. Did you know? Let me say it again. Did you know? One more time. Did you know that this verse is about you, even though it talks about Jesus? Did you know that when you understand about what Jesus did for you, it helps you get into a greater and more personal relationship with God, building your very faith and strength in the things of God so that you can have the confidence that you need to make the proper petitions before the Lord? I'm going to read you the verse and I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to give you the title of the message. But I want to explain the verse to you first. So I want you to listen. Listen closely. Don't let your minds wander. It's just too rich. It's just too good. Don't let your thoughts go some foolish place that's empty and vain. Put your heart on the things of God for the next few minutes and watch God change your life and touch your heart. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 15, says it like this. 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. It's one of those verses that you read and you kind of like blow through and go to a verse that you understand. Because it's not an easy verse to understand and certainly the depth of the verse is bizarre, as you'll see in a moment. The verse says so very much. First of all, it says we do not have a, a normal high priest. A normal human type high priest in the past is a high priest that offered the blood of bulls and goats. Our high priest, Jesus, offers something so superior, his own blood for you and I. The high priest of the past, if you'll remember, ordained by man. But here our high priest is ordained by God the son of the living God. You will find that this high priest is one who has not just a earthly perspective of an annual time of year to offer, but one who is eternal in the heavens. It's much greater than the human high priest is your high priest. But he says something that's a mouthful here. So we don't have just a standard high priest on our side. We have something else. One who can sympathize with our weakness. Listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. There was something that human high priests had that Jesus lacked. Whoa, what a statement. Let me say it again. There was something that human high priest had that Jesus, the superior high priest, lacked. And he knew it. He created man. He created the earth. He spoke and understand it. He called men forth gathering the dust, blew life into man, but he never was man himself. And therefore, as our high priest, he couldn't feel what you feel until he becomes man. He didn't know the pain of the life. He didn't know the pressures of life. He didn't know the temptations of life, which we oftentimes fall to, which we oftentimes give in to. He didn't understand any of that. He knew what it was like, but he had never felt it. And in order for him to be your advocate, that means attorney in heaven, before the high courts of heaven, in order for him to plead your case, he has to have compassion on you, knowing what it was like that you went through that, knowing where you're at, knowing the experience and what you feel, so that he can be that great advocate, high priest, that is petitioning the high courts of heaven for you. He becomes your eternal intercessor not just somebody who prays for you but somebody who prays for you because they feel you wow the verse is power packed notice what it says we don't just have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. He can sympathize with our weakness because the pressures of life and the weaknesses of man were upon him too but was on all points tempted. In other words, all the pressure you ever had in your life has come against him. He knows you, he understands you, he feels you, and that's what makes him a superior high priest. And one who can get into your heart and understand and feel you is obviously a greater one than one who just stands off at a distance. Whew. He was tempted as we are. Then it comes along, instead of oftentimes we fall to those temptations, he didn't. The verse is so amazing and so powerful. Well, when I was talking to God about this verse, showed me something very fascinating. He showed me that Jesus had to see that he lacked the feelings of men. What it was really like to be tempted. Number one, he had to see that. Number two, he had to experience or he had to feel what we feel. 
And number three, which makes him a superior high priest, is that his great compassion and acts of compassion towards us is because he saw and he felt, which brought, brings us to a place of compassion. Without feeling, there is not godly compassion. Let me say it again. I can give to you. I can do this and fulfill something, become a very religious person doing it. I can do that because it's a thing to do. But if I do it from my heart, that's when it makes a difference. And when it comes from my heart, it's because I feel it. So godly compassion comes from feeling what the situation is because you observed it or saw it. And here in verse 15, there's a formula for godly compassion. Let me say it again. Here in verse 15, there's a formula for godly compassion. Here's the formula. Let's just pop it up on the overhead for us. Would you do that for me? See or recognize plus feel equals really godly compassion. You'll see that all through the ministry of Jesus. And by the way, is there anybody you want to follow besides Jesus? Because there's nobody better than Jesus. The witness that is not mine, don't follow me. Paul even writes, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, Paul, if you don't follow Christ, I'm not following you. Guess what? The ultimate one we follow is Jesus. And the example for every one of us is who? Jesus. And Jesus saw that he lacked. And Jesus now, listen, recognized his position. And Jesus now comes into his flesh. He feels mankind and the frailty of mankind. Why? So that he can express compassion that changed the world that we live in. Mm. Yeah. You say, well, what has that got to do with me? If he's our example for every one of us, that's the way we ought to be. We don't do that in American churches today. Oftentimes, I'm not saying all the churches, but we don't do it for the most part. At least here's what we do. We isolate ourselves from seeing and isolate and insulate ourselves from feeling. Therefore, the compassion that's given is very low-key and religious and not from the heart, never accomplishing, nor is it backed by God that changes the world that we're living in. And if I continue my walk with God and I isolate myself and I insulate myself from the he needs of the world, from the pain of people, then I can't say that I could be like Jesus. Jesus realized he needed to feel the pain of the people in order to be this great and amazing high priest. Which brings me to the title of the message, our compassionate now you understand, high priest. Our compassionate high priest is what you and I need to understand that God wants to take us to. Because without feeling, there's no compassion. There's only religious acts that isn't very much supported by God. We don't need to be afraid of it. Because God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Today, I want to share some things from the life of Jesus, if I may, for all of us to see for ourselves exactly what I'm saying to you in a more comprehensive way. Why? So that you can walk out of this place today and say, wow, I've got some areas in my life I need to work on and not be afraid of. I now know and understand that if I'm going to extend compassion to a lost world that's dying. I need to feel that lost world in order to do it right from my heart, not run from it. Let's take a look at four areas in the life of Jesus where he saw, where he felt, listen to this, and where he extended compassion. Four areas in the life of Jesus that you will see the formula for bringing forth the proper compassion. Is anybody listening today in the house of God? Areas of his compassion. Number one, broken humanity. I don't like the world. I don't 
don't want anything to do with the world. I think the world is stupid and foolish. A bunch of idiots arguing about everything that means nothing. I think they make bad choices. I think they're bad people. I don't like the way they're going. I don't like the trends of this country. I don't like anything. And I say this to all of us, we're all there and you know it. The bottom line, without Christ, what in the world do we expect except broken humanity? They are exactly what they are. You watch CNN, you yell at the television. You watch Fox News, you yell at the television. You watch CBS, NBC, ABC, you're always fighting with the television. You watch a movie, it's full of junk. We've got broken humanity. Right is wrong, wrong is right. What do we expect without Jesus Christ? They're like scattered everywhere. They have no idea where to go. There is no leadership whatsoever that's going to take them. And the only kind of a leadership anybody can ever have is somebody who will lead them deeper into Jesus. So here we find ourselves with Jesus being confronted with broken humanity. Me, I don't like them at all. But Jesus didn't look at it that way. Jesus saw it differently. Go with me to Matthew, if you will, in the ninth chapter of Matthew. In Matthew, the ninth chapter, let's take a look at it ourselves in verse 36. Notice what it says in verse 36 of the ninth chapter. You got your Bible? Watch this. But when he saw the multitude, circle the word saw. First thing you see right off the bat is he saw something. Remember, in order to feel, you're going to have to see something. You see, you feel, then you produce compassion, godly compassion. He saw the multitudes. He was moved. He's now feeling with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Do you know what a sheep having no shepherd really means? Listen to this, guys. Sheep have no defensive weapons. Sheep have no offensive weapons. They have no claws to scratch. They have no teeth to bite. They have no thick skin and hide whatsoever. They're at the prey of whatever they're out there. Anything can come along. Their only hope is that they're in a herd with a shepherd over them that protects them. Without the shepherd protecting them and the group working together, they're vulnerable to whatever attacks that might come their way. So Jesus looks at the world and says, man, they are like sheep having no shepherd. And then he comes along in verse number 37, he makes this statement, he says, then he said to his disciples, here's now the administration, listen to this, of compassion. The harvest is truly plentiful and the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers under this field. In other words, they need people to help them get back on track. That's the answer. The lost and dying world. The answer is not pulling away from them. The answer is not hating them. The answer is not despising them. The answer is not cursing them. The answer is to feel their pain. They got there for a reason and without God that's where they're going to be. But with God they can be a, a flock of God that grows and flourishes. <laughs> Areas of compassion. Number one, broken humanity. Number two, Areas of compassion. The unfortunate. This one really breaks my heart. The unfortunate are those that are just caught up in the bad ways of life. They didn't do anything. They were born in a filthy house and they still stay in a filthy house. They didn't have people who cared about them and loved them. They were caught up in the sins of this world by their parents. They were in a place they shouldn't be. 
They didn't have the privileges you have. They don't have the things you have. They don't have the hope you have. They don't have the future you have. They never had a parent put a hand around their shoulders and care for them. They never had somebody hold them. They never had somebody love them. They never had somebody encourage them. And they're the unfortunate one. They're caught in broken humanity with no hope and no future, having no goals and no vision, having no desires. Don't ever think they can go anywhere. And I'm here here to tell you, your compassionate high priest cares about broken humanity. And the unfortunate people that are in there. Unfortunate people, mistreated, never get a break. They're the ones that feel that life has dealt them the wrong cards. The answer, by the way, for anybody that feels that way in this room, and there's many of you that do, the answer to that is a level playing field. The level playing field will never be given to you by the government. The level playing field will be given to you by Jesus Christ. And you are designed and made by God to be part of broken humanity. He knew it. And then when unfortunate circumstances take place in your life, when you get back to God, God will get back to you. Amen. And the sins of the fathers are over with, with Jesus. Matthew, while you're there in the 20th chapter, listen to the heartbeat of Jesus. As compassion is being expressed towards those who live life in an unfortunate circumstances. Matthew, the 20th chapter, starting in verse number 29. Are you there? Listen to this. In verse number 29, now when they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Notice there's a lot of people around Jesus at this time. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road. Isn't it interesting that God is now going to bring out for our attention two blind men sitting by the road. They are low-life type people. They don't have anything. They're not sitting on a donkey. They're not leaning against a stick. They don't have anything. These are men probably that were born blind since birth. And somehow, when the world dealt them a garbage situation, they find themselves sitting by the road. Notice how they had two uh, together. They had come together together. Two blind men find each other. We need each other. And you will always gravitate to people that are like you. Except when you're like Jesus who gravitate to the unfortunate. When they had heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O, o Lord. Son of David. I don't know if you know what he just said, but somehow when he made that statement, both of these men crying this same thing out, we find that it catches the attention of God and he sees them. And that's the first step to the compassion of God working on their behalf. You see the words there that says, oh, he says this, son of David. They knew something about Jesus that most people in those days didn't know. That he was in the bloodline of David. And God's promise to David was that his kingdom would be an eternal kingdom. And who makes it an eternal kingdom of David was Jesus Christ. And when they said, oh, son of David, they knew something about Jesus that caught his attention. And then you know what happens. Let's read it. Notice what it says. Then they heard Jesus, they passed by, they cried out. Verse number 31. Then the multitude warned them. Now here's not a just person saying, shut up. All the people are saying to them, shut up. And the multitude warned them and said to them, you should be quiet. Don't you know the church will always try to shut you up and cause you to be something like they are? Don't you know that people will always try to tell you what to do? But I'm here to tell you, when you're unfortunate, you've got nothing to lose. You've got to go for God with all of your heart and all of your life. And I don't care who you offend, you've got to go for God. And the world will try to shut you up. But you can't shut up. There's something on the inside of you. 
They cry out even the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And Jesus stood still. See those words, Jesus stood still? Circle it. He saw them. First part of the formula. And called to them and said, What would you have me to do for you? Of course, you know what they're going to say. Verse 33, And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes be open. And Jesus had compassion. He felt. Before the act came forth that changed their life, there was the feeling because he saw. And Jesus had compassion. And he touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight. And they followed him. Wow. We're talking about areas of his compassion. Because if I'm going to be a Christian, listen, let me say it again one more time to you. Because if I'm going to be a Christian, I don't want to follow what men say. I want to follow the one I should be following. The example for me is Jesus. Not a man, not a world, not a system, not the moral majority. Not some political agenda. My following in life has got to be Jesus. And here Jesus sees and doesn't separate himself, doesn't isolate himself, doesn't insulate himself from the pains of men. And there he feels and there he administers compassion. My goodness sakes alive. For all of us that are in here, this is an awakening for all of us. The third area of compassions, brokenhearted. The brokenhearted, those of you that people have let you down and your heart's broken. People have made promises and violated the promises. People have come into your life and violated you. People who you thought were going to be someone you could put trust in, there is no trust whatsoever. People who made promises that didn't keep them. The brokenhearted, those that have lost in life, lost children, lost families, lost husbands, lost wives. Life has just treated you poorly and your heart aches for it. Jesus, this great high priest of compassion, is there with you. And I love this. In Luke, the seventh chapter, go there with me. In Luke, the seventh chapter, in verse number 11, says it like this. Let's go to Luke, the seventh chapter, verse number 11. Now it happened on that day that he entered in the city called Ann. Many of the disciples went with him in a large crowd. So here he is with a large group of people and his disciples. When he came near to the gate, behold, a dead man was being carried out. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but in other societies, what they do, not in our societies, they'll march down the streets of their village. They'll put a dead person in the coffin. The pole bearers will lift them up. They're not pole bearers. They're actually coffin carriers. They'll lift the dead man in his coffin above the head, and they will all march down the street, Weeping and crying as they march down the street. That was what taking place here. It happens all the time. It wasn't new to Jesus. But something happened on that particular day that was unique to Jesus that is described in the scripture. It says these words, and it's powerful words. A dead man being carried out. The only son of his mother... And she was a widow. In other words, it wasn't about the dead man. It was about the woman. He cared about her heart. She was obviously crying. You'll see that in a moment. She had lost her only son. She had lost her husband. She was now alone in life. She now has nothing. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus cares about those that have broken hearts, that life is just mistreated, and life just cares. It just hurts on the inside. And the restorer of that is Jesus. He goes to her because he saw her. And he says, do not weep. 
Then he came and he touched the open coffin. He didn't touch the body because that would have been against the law. But he touched the coffin. And when he touched the coffin, those who were carrying it stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto you, arise. And he was dead, sat up and began to speak. And he presented to his mother. Can you imagine how God heals the brokenhearted? If you're in this place today and you're a person that carries a heavy heart, I'm here to tell you, hang around Jesus won't be long before God heals the heart. And we as followers of Christ ought to be seeing people with heavy hearts instead of judging them and criticizing them for wherever they're at. Who knows why and what put them to where they're at. We need to be people with compassion. And you'll never be a person of great compassion until you open your eyes and see and feel no matter what. Why they're there isn't important. Just feel the pain of the person. Areas of compassion, broken humanity, the unfortunate, the brokenhearted, last one. Areas of compassion to the unclean. For us, the unclean means this. You have so screwed up in life, you don't think God cares about you and you don't think you're worthy of God at all. You have operated in so much sin that surely your thinking is God wouldn't want you. I want you to know that with God there is no such thing as a throwaway. And even though you don't think of yourself as unworthy, can I just tell you the truth? There isn't one person in here who is worthy of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. We all deserve hell, but we will get heaven. And we were all unclean, but Jesus came and washed us with his blood and made us clean. The example is an interesting example of the leper who comes to Jesus in Mark, the first chapter. Leprosy is a crazy thing. Leprosy is when you're real sick and your body is rotten and your bottle parts are falling off. Your fingers fall off and then your hands fall off and your face falls off and your cheeks fall off. Your arms fall off, and then you eventually die. It is exactly what sin does. It'll tie you up, cause you to be sick, and let you live until all of your parts are no good whatsoever and you're unclean. A leper, when he was, had leprosy, was told he couldn't be touched by the people, couldn't come around the people at all. But this one comes after Jesus. And everybody that's unclean should come after Jesus. Mark, the first chapter, says these words. But he said to them, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also. Because for this purpose I have come forth. Verse 39, I thought it was interesting. He was preaching in the synagogue throughout Galilee and casting out demons. Isn't it interesting he's preaching in a church casting out demons? There's demons in the church. Is anybody listening? You show yourself in my church, I'll cast you out. I don't care what anybody says. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, verse number 40, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Notice the first thing Jesus saw him. And Jesus moved with the compassion he felt. Then it says he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing to be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken immediately, the leprosy left, left him and he was cleansed. My friends, listen to me. Jesus is the answer for everybody's problem. Doesn't matter how bad the world is in broken humanity. Doesn't matter whether you're unfortunate and the cards didn't fall right for you and you never had the privileges of some of the other people. Doesn't matter whether you're broken hearted and have lost other things in the past. 
Doesn't matter if you're a person who is unclean because you feel bad about yourself because of the filthy activities that you've always lived in and have done all of your life and that which has been done to you. And you know it, what I'm talking about. I'm here to tell you that you have a compassionate high priest in the heavens. One who loves you. One who feels you. One who cares about you. He's the only one that went to the cross and died for you. No devil in hell ever died for you. And today I say there's hope. Today there's a tomorrow. I want you to know there's a destiny. There's a purpose. There's a reason that God has for you because of his great compassionate act. Now the question to this church is simple. What am I asking? I'm simply saying if we all get together and we see and we feel, we will express compassion to a lost and broken world that needs to hear about Jesus. After all, is he not the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Is his not word greater than any other word? Can he not heal every person that's sick? Can he not raise everything that's dead? Can he not open every door that needs to be opened? Can he close every door that needs to be closed? Does he walk on water? Does he open the blind eyes? Does he heal the sick? Does he raise the dead? His name, his name, his name is Jesus. You and I do not have to be afraid. We do not have to, as a church, hide ourselves from the infirmities and sicknesses and brokenness of the world. We don't need to build in the part of the city that is good in the suburbs where there's money. We need to build our churches in the middle of where hell is, in the middle of San Bernardino, to do the job that God would have us to do, to express the compassion of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why this church is here. That's why we have a San Bernardino address. That's why no other church was built for 45 years until we came here. That's why the record books say it's the graveyard of preachers. I want you to know something. It's a graveyard of the devil. God's good. I'm finished. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Give me just your attention for a moment. Let the ushers finish their job. Let's talk. Nobody, please, nobody get up. Listen to me now. Listen, listen, listen. Nobody get up. I'm talking to you. Everybody stay seated. I want to talk to you just for a moment. One of the worst things that could ever happen in your existence is that you walk out of this place, your heart stops, you die, you close your eyes, and you open them in hell. I don't want that to happen. Have you ever thought about what makes you think you're gonna to go to heaven? If you're gonna die someday and you know it, what makes you think you're gonna to go to heaven? Some people think they're gonna to go to heaven because they're good. Guess what, nowhere in the Bible say you get to go to heaven because you're good. You're not gonna make it, somebody needs to tell you. Some people think they're gonna to go to heaven because you know their mom and dad told them they were Christians when they were kids. Put a cross, St. Christopher, around their neck, had him christened or baptized as a baby. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven. Nowhere. Not in the Bible. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I joined my last church. I was there for years. It was a Christian church, sang in the choir, helped the pastor out. I even taught Sunday school. I was a real leader in that church. Can you show me somewhere in the Bible it says you're a leader in the church, taught Sunday school, sang in the choir, you get to go to heaven, have eternal life? Listen, I don't give a flip. You graduate from seminary school. 
you're not going to make it to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. And then he tells us how to get there in John 3rd chapter. He said, you must be born again. When I use the words born again, immediately a lot of people turn off, but don't today. You're turning off because the media and Hollywood movies and stuff like that have made born again people look like idiots and fools, but they're not. It's not what God's talking about. To be born again, here's what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to be born again. So listen to what Jesus says, and here's what it means so that you'll know clearly what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I'm coming again. Oh, you know he is. We just don't know when, but you know he is. And he says, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really said? He said, people that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all even though they call themselves Christians, and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus when he comes. Some of you have been lukewarm, and today is your day to make the change. What is lukewarm? Little in, little out. Here's lukewarm, little up, little down. Here's lukewarm, you know, God is something, but he's not everything. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God. Watch this, watch this. But you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Today, it's your day of salvation. Let's don't go another day without Jesus. This wonderful, compassionate high priest is waiting to be your advocate, to be your intercessor. Pray for you and petition the high courts of heaven for your blessings. But you're going to have to give him all of your heart. You're going to have to give him all of your life. Today, God brought you here for this reason. Today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I get right with God? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And then I'll pop my hands together. It'll sound like this. Bang! When you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up. When I see your hand go up, you're saying something to me, and you're saying something to God. You're saying, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I don't want just Jesus in my head like most Americans celebrate Christmas and Easter and know who he is because that won't get me to heaven. I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to be born again and give God all my heart and life. You know who you are and you know you need to do it. You say, Pastor Jim, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Yep, 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 you will be. But guess what, who cares? It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Today, it's your day of salvation. This old man loves you enough to tell you the truth. Now it's time for you to get right with God. All across this auditorium, I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. You get your hand up, let me see it, put it right back down. How simple is that? Simple, simple, simple. Don't miss this time. You've missed a lot of opportunities. Don't miss this opportunity in life. Your eternal life is at stake. I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. Three. Thank you. Four. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's five back here. Six. Seven. Thank you. Eight. Nine. Ten. Thank you. Anybody else? Eleven. Back over here. Thank you. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Thank you. Come on. If you're not sure, get your hand up. If you're never giving all your heart, this is your time. There's fourteen. I already got them. I, there's fifteen. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one back here, 16. God bless you on this far side somewhere. I got you back there, 17. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? You're going to miss this. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? 
Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for seven new wise people. Today, here's what I want you to do. All 17 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, really quick. Hear me now. Listen, when you come to this church, there's a little bit of a traffic jam getting out. This church is worth the traffic jam getting out. So don't complain. It's just going to be the way it is. It's part of the church. It's the culture we're in. Don't worry about that. I need to do this. It's more important than whether you get out fast and whether those people come in. So I'll let you go in just a moment, but all 17 of you and anybody that should have raised their hand but didn't, this is your time to come forward. Get your stuff, get your friends, get out of your seat, meet me right here in front. You come right now. Come on, 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 come on. I decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Thank God you guys have come. Real quick, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. He's a really good guy. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff, introduce you to a program we have. And let me tell you something. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. Make a commitment today and forever. Don't just do it an emotional thing up here just in front of people at this time. Do it forever. Let us help you to keep that commitment. Will you make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave right over there? Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.